Welcome back after another, well, we've had a couple of weeks off, okay? Uh, it was the Easter holidays, the weather was great, and even though we are always happy to be back in work, it was a little bit, on Tuesday, it was a little bit difficult. Me and Jalal were in work on the Tuesday, and we struggled, I'll be honest. It was a great Saturday, Sunday, Monday, good time with the family, and it was still nice outside, and we're like, oh, this is heavy, back to back to the grind, it's busy, busy, busy. So... Apologies for everyone that's been messaging saying, um, where are you for two weeks? The reason we were off is we thought it'd be a good chance to have a couple of weeks off, or I did anyway, because Barry has had a baby. More specifically, his missus has had a baby. And a gorgeous boy called Parker. Um, Barry, very happy. Everyone's happy and healthy. And um, Barry's with us today, not doing his normal amount of input into the podcast, as every week. How are you, Barry? Yeah, thought so. Good. So I think Barry's when he gets there, he would have been here this week, but as with every newborn baby, they take over your life and they are the bosses. So it's great to see Barry squirming and um, hopefully he will be back next week and we'll be doing a bit more of a technical podcast because this week it is Innovate versus Imitate and we'll go away for the intro. And we'll be back to talk about Innovate versus Imitate. Thank you very much for joining the MPK podcast once again. All good? Ready to go? Turn my voice up a little bit. Oh, God, everyone watching, the whole family. Are you ready to go? Are you going to be in the house, in the house that I built, in the booth that I built? I know people tune in every Sunday to listen, but even when business is good, we still manage to do the podcast. So for everyone watching on YouTube, that was the intro. Uh, Coachy does his magic and edits it. Pr- what, what's it called? Uh, post-edit. That's where the magic of post-edit comes into. So it's innovate or imitate today, but we've got a couple of messages t- t- to get across. The first one is a little bit of a sad one. Um, his name was Chili Bob, and he ran a chili farm in Oxfordshire. Oh, it, no, sorry, it was in Nottingham. Um, and he passed away uh, with his friends and family. I think it was it was last week. So just sending out our condolences and our thoughts to Chili Bob's family and friends as well. Um, as every week, the podcast would not be able to participate or continue without the partners of Canna, Sunlight, Can Filters, Autopot, and Revolution Microelectronics. Um, what we're going to do as well with the partners. We're going to dedicate a podcast to each of the partners. So over the summer, if you don't really know about who our partners are, uh, we're going to dedicate a podcast to each of them. So one week, we're going to talk about the benefits of sunlight and LEDs uh, in particular. And the next week, we'll be talking about extraction with can filters in mind. Then we'll be talking about systems, and we're going to be mentioning Autopot and the benefits of that system. Then we'll be talking about double-ended light fixtures, and that's where Revolution Microelectronics come into. And then we'll be talking about nutrients, and we're going to be talking about why we believe Canna to be the most widely distributed, the most widely sold uh, nutrient in the UK, and one of the big up-and-comers in the US and around the world. So... I also had a bit of a, if you can, if you, if you're noticing a little bit of a graveliness in my voice this week, it's because um, I got hit with the eye infection. So as all parents will know with young children, they get everything. So my little lad has been to nursery over the Easter holidays and has got a little bit of an eye infection. So being the doting father, I'm cleaning it up. Not really given much thought to what happens with eye infections being very contagious. And um, wiping up, and I've, I've only gone and got it myself, haven't I? So that put me out of action for a few days. And um, it's back to the podcast, though. We're, we're nearly fighting fit. Got a bit of a gravelly voice with a sore throat, but I, c- I couldn't have the podcast going on for three weeks without it, without giving you something. So I'm here, I'm being a trooper, and we're ready to go. Um, 
before we move on to the innovate and imitate, we've got a couple more things to mention. Uh, we have had for the PGR donation page on crowdfunding a phenomenal response. Uh, I want to give a shout out to the people that have got involved already. Some of them are anonymous. Some of them didn't put the names. Um, and I just thank you for those people you know who you have done donated and you were anonymous. Thank you very much for getting involved. The first person to get involved was Mills Nutrients. So they've donated the full amount to get the full range tested. And this is going to be getting sent off this week for the first batch. So well done for Mills for getting for being first up, asking the right questions and getting straight in there. Next, we had BioBiz, the organic range. They're also getting the full range tested um, and they've just gone full bore. And there's only seven products in the BioBiz range. So they've donated the full um, amount to get 10 products tested. So basically they've also contributed towards getting other products tested. And I believe Mills have donated a full amount and we'll be able to get another two products tested with Mills' as money. Hydrotops is a company that's donated in full and give extra as well. So they're getting their full full range done. Their A and B grow, their A and B bloom, uh, all the bacterias, the flower base, the flower um, enhancers, and what else was the root stems? Just the whole line. They're getting all that that done. Uh, who else is there? Vitalink from Hydro Garden. They've got involved. They're going to be donating bits over the next few weeks and months to get a variety of their products tested. We've got Shogun are really, really interested. They want a couple of, they're going to come and see us soon and get some technical questions answered, but they're pretty much fully involved to get their full range tested. Moonshine are getting their two products tested and donated a little bit more so that we can for the projects so that we can get more items and products tested. And I think, oh, Highlight as well. Highlight Horticulture as a wholesaler have donated to the project to get um, to get items and products tested. So I think I've covered them all there. Um, if I've missed anybody, then it's by mistake, and I will mention you next week. So stay tuned. The PGR project is doing really, really well, and, um, and we'll see how we're getting on with it. Right, the last bit is the Hydroponic Expo. So the Hydroponic Expo, uh, we're mentioning this because it is a new uh, festival. It is the week after the Autopop Festival. It is the 23rd, 24th and 25th of, of August. It's in Warwickshire and it's right next to Product Earth. So the two separate shows, but they're on the same time and in the same location as Product Earth. Now the Hydroponic Expo is the first exhibition in the UK to do with hydroponic companies since I believe 2015. Every year we go on about the Autopop Festival, which is a trade only uh, summer social. And that means that growers and end consumers can come to this festival. So with the Hydroponic Expo, you can, everyone's welcome. You purchase tickets and on the website, it is hydroponicexpo.co.uk you can go there to purchase your tickets and we've actually got 10 tickets from the hydroponic expo to give away so on next week's podcast once you've all managed to hear this and you know about the hydroponic expo we're going to be thinking of a way to give 10 tickets so you can get in for free but i must push you all all the listeners and all the uk beast listeners that are avid listeners to our podcast please please get down and attend this show it's your first opportunity in nearly four years to be able to go down and see every leading manufacturer every leading distributor there's going to be shops walking around we'll be there we'll be there with our podcast and we want to get you involved as well so on our podcast uh, you come down on the saturday and you'll ask your questions so coats the ad uh, producer will be there josh will be there a lot of all the media team will be there the lads from uh, mpk will all be there so we want to get you on the podcast you ask your questions and then we'll answer them live the following week or a couple of weeks after on the podcast so it's going to be a really good way to engage the end user so please please come down check out the hydroponic expo and make sure you, you book that weekend off because it's going to be a really good weekend i can assure you Right, that's it. We're on to innovate or imitate. Now, you're, this used to be innovate versus imitate part one and part two, where 
industry talking subjects, who's innovating, who's imitating. For the people that have just recently joined us and haven't listened to podcasts maybe two years ago, which I believe the last Innovate versus Imitate was a couple of years ago, 2017. I'm going to give you a little bit of a recap. So Innovate versus Imitate part one. We started off with ONA versus ONA, which the ONA, I'm classifying as the odor neutralizing agent. That's what they call themselves. ONA is distributed by Easy Grow and ONA is distributed by Hydro Garden. Um, Easy Grow in the original podcast won this one as we found ONA to be the innovator. Uh, we found that we used a machine called Way Back When on Google and we found that it that ONA from Easy Grow was in was available to buy in around 2008 and then ONA uh, which is the odor neutralizing agent by Hydro Garden was around 2014 so it was quite a big difference and from our research we found that ONA was the innovating product and then we had the plug and grow timer now this one caused a bit of a, a ruckus because we said that the plug and grow were the originals and the others were imitators but we also said had something to say about the back of the timer some So on the back of the plug and grow timer and on the back of every other copied timer, it can say supports 3,200 watts uh, on the back of it, which would mean, would lead some growers to believe that you can, you can plug, that, that timer can time something up to 3,200 watts. And it's technically correct. So what it means is that when you plug it into a contactor, that timer can support 3,200 watts. But people aren't doing that. They're just putting this timer onto a standard extension cable and expecting it to run two, three, four, six hundred watt lights. That won't happen. You'll blow the timer, you'll blow the um, extension cable and your lights just won't turn on anymore. And people are having this problem. So we were saying that it needs to be a bit clearer on the back of the uh, plug and grow timer. And... I'm not sure if he's changed that yet, but um, basically what they've done is they've gone over and they've evaluated every other timer that has been imitating the plug and grow timer. So it's Trade Hydro and they've produced a report which he'll be publishing hopefully in the next few weeks or months. And I'm going to read out some of it to you. So with Black Orchid, uh, it's exactly the same timer, but currently infringes our trademark having a description as plug and grow. Uh, the managing director of the company has taken action and the product has been discontinued, which has been respected in from Black Orchid there. Hacienda had the same case, but has a different box design, but it's still a copy. Power plant, copied case and box design, but no reference anywhere to its rating. And the Eclipse copied the case and the box design and complete copy of the instruction sheet. All of the above are electrically safe and can be classed as a heavy duty timer. Uh, they all have an eight amp switch. So even though the copies, he's gone through them and said that um, they're, they're safe, you can use them. Um, and then he goes on to mention grow gadgets, lumen light, spectra light, and ultra vivid all have the wrong rating. Some of them advertise themselves as eight amps on the instruction sheet, but it's only a four amp, which is not good. Um, Spectralite has a four amp switch and ultra vivid also has a three amp switch. So some companies are copying and not marketing themselves as having the appropriate connectors or timers. So that's that's not good. And it's brilliant that he's brought this to light because hopefully these companies can either change it or just stop making the timers. It's what we're going to do is, I think we had a, light, a small issue there going live. So we're going to go, I'm going to recalibrate it on my computer and hopefully we'll come back up live again. So if Josh can hear me, if you could nip in and find the live thing on my computer so I can have a little look at it when it's ready, only when it's ready, bud. So then we had unbranded timers. Uh, test, he tested four unbranded timers with no logo or name on the front. All of them only had three amp or four amp switches internally. They all had poor build quality. And then the last one was Maxi Switch Pro Solo. Um, he said he's excluding this from the list. It has copied the case, but does advertise itself as three amp but it actually has a 16 amp resistive four amp inductive switch. Um, 
clearly capable of switching a 600 light and advertised itself as a three amp single light timer. So there was a lot of, um, a lot of timers out on the market. Um, Plug and Grow believe themselves to be one of the originals. I wouldn't dispute that case. And all the others seem to have copied his case design, box design, and some of them have even copied the instruction manuals. And we're going to move on to why that can be a problem for some people and for, for some shops and for some growers in a minute. Fit next up was the 6040s, Battle of the 6040s. So Gold Label was the first to produce a 6040 mix. They, they did go through a period where the bags didn't quite have 50 litres in them. Uh, and then Canon Dutch Pro have come to the market with a, some sort of 6040 blend. So some of them were at 60 pebbles, 40 cocoa, some are 40 cocoa, um, sorry, 40 pebbles, 60 cocoa. And so you've got to be careful, make sure that you read the bag and see which is the mix and see which one's right for you. A gold label come back, readjusted the labels on the bag and said that it, was, it came down to, they had EN litres. So if you're interested in that, you can do the research and find out what happened. But gold label uh, have adjusted the bags, remarketed, and they now have a, a proper 45 litres in them and say that they have 45 litres in them. Now, what I wanted to say about this was that with with something like 6040 and the cocoa and the pebbles, you can bring out a product and gold label, we're the first, we do know this. So I don't think they had too much of a dispute when Canna brought out their 6040, when Dutch Pro brought out their version of 6040. And it comes down to when do we have a problem with innovation? Uh, when do we have a problem with imitation? Because imitation is not always a bad thing. If you can imitate a product and make a good product a little bit cheaper and more available to a portion of a proportion of uh, the, the end consumers that can't maybe spend a high amount of money on innovative products, then that's okay in my book. If you produce a product that is the same price, inferior quality, doesn't make many changes, then that's where we have a problem. This is where the Innovate versus Imitate podcast actually stemmed from. So, Josh is saying to me, I need to move over. <laughs> Left or right? See what happens, Barry, when you're off. We're all... Conf- yeah, we're, I'm in the way now. I'm all good, I'm all good. So there we go. So I'm live again. Right, we're back live. So the main problem for people listening, the main problem that I had with imitation is that a lot of imitation would look at a product that was doing well and they would just copy it. They would sell for the same price using inferior components and they're not doing anything for the end consumer. They're just looking to put money in their pockets, which is a problem. But then you've got also got the other argument. So I'm going to use the 6040s. Gold Label with the first producer 6040 mix and Canon and Dutch Pro have done um, their own 6040s. I'm sure others have, have done by now as well. What? When does it come down to just business? If you don't, if I don't know if you can trademark a blend of 60 and 40, but when do we? When can we have a problem? And when do we just have to let things slide? When is it just business? And when is it just competition? So, if your product can be patented, I believe that it only costs around £300 to put a patent onto a product. So for big companies, that should just be done and dusted. If you can't patent your product, then come to market with it as quickly as possible and just market the shit out of it because a lot of the time, face-to-market products always do the best. They get the biggest market share. They have the biggest faith from the end consumers, from the growers, and they tend to do the best. Um, So it's a difficult argument because there's... There's the ethical side of things where you don't want to copy. You don't want to be seen as an imitator and you want to be seen as innovating and bringing new products to the market. But at the same time, business is business. And if you see a product that's doing well and your company can make it and it can make itself some money, then there's an argument there for bringing products to market. But, and I'm going to speak from the heart now, that's not good enough because if you can't make the product better, and you, or you can't make it cheaper and more affordable to end consumers, then it looks or appears as though you're simply making a product, copying a product to put more money into your business's pockets, which 
it only benefits yourselves. You're looking to take a market share away from an innovator and you're looking to put that money into your pocket. So I'd always say, if, you, if you're looking at products, if there's any manufacturers that are looking at products now, then think of ways, can you use cheaper components? Can you make it more affordable? Um, to If there's a product out there now for £300 and you can make that product and get it to the end consumer for £200, but with cheaper components, then do it. That's acceptable in my opinion. But you have to let people know that it's if you came out with this product, Product X, and you said, we've got this product, it's, it's we've based it on Product Y. Ours is £100 cheaper to you, but it does have some limitations, or we do use slightly inferior build quality. We've made it so that it's more available to people who haven't, you might not have £300 or £400 to spend on a product. And if you marketed it like that, it would become much more acceptable to shops, people like myself, and the end consumer as well. They know where they stand. You're not trying to hoodwink them into making them think that your product for £200 is just as good as a product X and you just want to get money off them. So there's, I'd like to see new ways of doing things when it comes to marketing products, innovating or imitating. I want to move on to Gavitas. Now, Gavitas were, and this is what I believe to be true, Gavitas were one of the innovators. They didn't make the double-ended light. They didn't innovate the double-ended light, but they were absolutely the pioneers of bringing that light to the hydroponics industry and, and getting us to use it. And it shows in what was their market share. So, Josh is probably going to throw up behind me a picture of a Gavita and a picture of a copy Gavita. And they look identical. But if you go onto eBay and you look for a double-ended 1,000-watt light unit, then you can. I think you can see the difference in build quality. In certain things, it's not good to spend less. When you're fucking about with electronics and you're messing about with things that get very hot, you don't want to go for the cheaper build. So when I was talking about things like 6040 or product X versus product Y, if you can keep it safe, then it's okay to go cheaper. I don't believe that you can keep electronics that get very hot and you put into a very hot grow room, also a very humid, damp environment at times. I don't think you should be fucking with cheap shit, if I'm honest with you. Um, and there's a lot of copies of Gavitas. There's a lot of copies copies of the hood design. Um, and the problem that this leads to is the basically the whole message of this podcast is that we should be supporting innovators and we shouldn't we should be very careful about do we give our money do we give our time and do we stock imitated products or do we stock the the products that imitate but we'll come to that at the end and how we support and how we can get the best out of this industry so i'm by myself barry's not here i'm gonna have a little drink because it's it, you know what it's hard work doing a podcast by yourself I'm going to kill. He's going to do all of it. Trust me, he's going to do all the work next week. So, the new innovations versus imitations. What have we got? The Diffuse Air versus the Pro Swaler. Now, the Diffuse Air um, was by Global Air Supplies. Pretty innovative product into our industry. There can be some argument that there's been uh, air diffusers in the kitchen and toilet industries and the house and in the building industry but nothing like the diffuse air in our industry a couple of months or maybe even a year after the diffuse air was launched the pro swaler by black orchid came out now when there was a little bit of a, a debate on instagram over who was first i i believe it was diffuse air. it was definitely diffuse air by global air supplies that were first to market but Black Orchid with their Pro Swaler say theirs was already in production or it was already in a, a state of research when the Diffuse Air came out. Now, we just, just to be um, trustworthy and honest and we look for the best in people, we're going to believe Black Orchid. Um, I was going to say there's no reason for them to lie. Well, there is, but we're going to take their word for it. The Diffuse Air was first, the Pro Swaler was second. The Pro Swaler does come in cheaper. 
But when I've spoken to Global Air Supplies, the amount of innovation and research and development that went into the diffuser, you can actually see pictures of them shining the lasers into the diffuser to see how the air will be distributed when you use it in your grow room. Having said that, and going back to trade hydro and air plug and grow, Black Orchid have also, they're going to take action and, and their product has been discontinued. And you've just got to take your hat off for that. So with some companies that we that we talk about, they don't take action. They've got nothing to say. And the managing director of Black Orchid actually sent me a long email. And I'm, I'm not going to show you what it is. But if you're watching on the YouTube channel, you can see basically two pages. I'll show you very quickly. Two pages of a written email to myself by uh, Graham Slade, who's the managing director. Now, you can say what you want, but putting together two pages and taking the time to write, to, to send me an email and doing two pages with links to other swirl diffusers and actually acknowledging um, that he can see from our perspective how he can come to the conclusion that they have simply copied the Pro Swirl Diffuser. Uh, from the outside, it does look very similar when you stand next to each other. However, I assure you this was not the case and I'd like to explain how. And goes into a lot of detail into how he was researching and developing this product and what was going on. So on this one, I will put my neck on the line and say the Fusay was the first to market. They were probably innovating reset not innovating well they were innovating actually they were innovating from the building industry looking at how certain products in the building industry distribute air around a room and they've taken that concept and put it into a grow room and it works phenomenally well by the way if you don't use a diffuse air um, it, they're just absolutely worth the money you just simply attach a four inch five inch six inch or even ten inch fans onto them put them at the top of your room and your humidity and your temperature is even all the way around the room. There's no, there's very few hot spots, uh, and you can put multiple thermometers around to check that as well. But I really like how Graham handled that, and I also from the Trade Hydro, I like how he's handled the plug and grow. He basically has removed his from, um, he's, he's discontinued his timer, uh, or he's going to wait, maybe redesign it, uh, come up with something maybe more innovative, and bring it back to market. So I've got nothing bad to say about Black Orchid. Uh, at the beginning, I get very rah rah about people that copy, and, I, and I'll explain why. Because I believe people, that, if you constantly support the imitators, innovators will stop innovating, and our industry will have less innovative products in them. But we're going to get to that at the end of the podcast, and I'm going to talk about why I feel like we should try our best to support the innovators. So take my hat off to uh, Graham and the team at Black Orchid. Mind my blank there. Take me hat off to Black Orchid and, and Graham uh, for that response, for the response to the plug and grow timer. A lot of companies just wouldn't bother, so I haven't got it in me. Even if Pro Swiller was a copy, uh, they've taken the time to respond to me, uh, to respond to Andy at Trade Hydro, and uh, yeah, that, that goes a long way in my book, so well done to them. Moving on, I don't want to get... So that was the main one for innovation versus imitation. And if we ever on this podcast say something that you don't agree with or you feel is wrong or we need to say it differently, then all you need to do is get in touch a lot. I don't know whether people don't get in touch with us because um, for for whatever reason, they just, they're either lazy or they've got... If you're lazy or you've got no substance to what you're going to say, then you probably can't get in touch on what we're saying is probably correct. But if you like Graham and you send us a letter, it just goes a long way. We can look into there's every story is two sides and we can look into both sides of the story and form a more conclusive opinion. And hopefully that's what we've done there. So moving on to other products. I've put I've written down LED versus LED. Who was first? Did they ruin it for others? Who's doing new innovative LEDs right now? So who was first? It was, and I'm going to make assumptions here, this is probably wrong, but people who looked at our industry and wanted to make money because 10 years ago, LEDs just did not cut the mustard in terms of horticulture. They were blue, they were red, missed out a 
massive proportion of the spectrum didn't have anywhere near the efficiency that they have today didn't have anywhere near the output that they did today that they do today they were making claims that their 250 watt fixture would replace your 1000 watt double ended fixtures and to be fair some of them are still making that claim today uh, which is just ludicrous you can't have a 250 watt replacing a 1000 watt fixture maybe in the next 10, 15, 20 years, we'll get to some sort of efficiency where that might be possible, but it's not possible for a long, long time. I think at the moment, we're probably around the bandwidth of, if your LED pulls 400, 450 watts, you can probably, and you spend a lot of money, I'm talking these are thousand pound units, uh, you can probably get away with them replacing a 600 or a 750 watt fixture. Um. Some of the, the best LEDs that I've seen at the moment, there's Urban Buddy came to visit us through the, through the day, actually, and they seem to have a solid... I haven't used one, but we've got one hanging in the shop, and we're going to start testing on them. And we're going to start really going hard on LED testing because I feel now's the time. Uh, it's been coming for maybe one or two years. Uh, you can start... You've seen Budmaster making huge innovations in the industry, um, and they've now moved forward onto the Cropmaster, a uh, very slick design, I might add. You've got Sunlight, who had the biggest selling LED in Germany, doing massive things over in Europe, and they're starting to make waves over in the UK now as well. Eamon Buddy, a uh, very, very knowledgeable guy, and I'm expecting them to probably do well. They're, theirs is a cob design, um, and quite affordable as well for, for what they're putting out. Uh, and then you've got the Avicii from Revolution Microelectronics, which is uh, it's basically retails for around £1,000 and is knocking out tremendous amounts of light, like phenomenal, will outshine pretty much anything. Um, and that's probably, when that lands in the UK, I imagine that'll do very well as well. Now, let's get back to who was first. We don't know who was first. Did they ruin it for others? Absolutely. I think that, if we hadn't fucked it up the first time, or LED manufacturers hadn't fucked it up the first time, then we'd probably be a little bit ahead of where we are today. We have genuine innovators in the industry. We have Paul from Budmaster and Cropmaster. We have the guys at Sunlight. We have Greg from Revolution Microelectronics, who's come up with the Avicii. Uh, we have the guys at Urban Buddy. Uh, others that come to mind, we have Photon Light. That seems to be making waves in, in the LED industry. Um, and there's 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 a lot of others out there as well that are, are doing good things. If they'd have been given the chance, if we'd have just looked at LEDs when they were first viable, they'd have been much further ahead now because more people would have bought into them and there wouldn't have been this backlash. A lot of people invested in LED in the early days and just did shit with them and it gave LEDs a bad name and it's taken this many years of good LED production to shake it off. And now I feel like, well, last summer was very, very hot. This summer is going to be hot. I feel like the turn's tired of for LEDs. You see more and more commercial facilities using LEDs over in the US, more and more in Europe. Uh, and I think the UK, if you're a shop that's ever been a bit pissed off with LEDs and just not give them much time, now's the time to start giving them giving them your time and attention because I think it's this is the, the tide to turn it. I've noticed that in Liverpool, our customers who were fully, fully magnetic, you couldn't get them off the magnetic, uh, cheap ones, even our customers are starting to move to digital. We're selling, now selling more and more digital lights. And with that, I think we'll start moving towards LED. I can feel that we're starting to get a lot more questions asked about LED. And it's time to give them our attention. Now, in terms of innovative or imitation, it's very hard to say. I don't. You don't tend to hear of people saying, well, he's copied my LED. I think there's so much scope for LED production and the industry is moving that fast that I don't think people have got a chance to copy. Like if, if Paul is a was a massive innovator and still is from Budmaster, who's now producing the Cropmaster, he, produced that, he was producing that much stuff if you'd have copied one of his products, by the time you'd have got it to market, he was already on the next product. If you try and copy Sunlight, by the time you've copied their design, their optics, their outputs, by the time that you've got it to market and got you start to get yourself some market share, Sunlight will have already moved to the next project and you're already behind. The same with the Avicii LED and Greg. These are 
inventors. These are people that innovate in the LED industry. And if you try and copy them, they're already six months ahead of you by the time you get yours to market. So I don't think LEDs have really got that much of a problem with imitation. If you do imitate an LED, you're already six months behind. And if you're looking to just make money and copy an LED, then you get, you're going to get found out really quickly. And people just haven't got the patience or the time. It's going to get tested very quickly. And if you're just copying somebody's LED, using cheaper components, you're going to get found out. So anyone who's thinking about just doing it on the cheap, uh, I wouldn't bother. HPS, I'm going to take another sip. Talking by yourself is hard work. Barry does loads of it, so I don't know how he gets gets through the day. So HPS versus HPS. Innovation with HPSs have started to slow down. We had the revolution uh, Diva, which was square wave technology, which is actually very old technology, but has been redesigned so that the basically the lifetime of the bulb is uh, a lot longer and the output is a lot stronger. And their fixtures have, have been doing really well. But innovation as a whole is slowing down. So when innovation slows down, imitation starts to pick up because you can imitate, you could imitate today uh, a Gavita light fixture and know that in a year's time, it probably won't have changed too much. But like I say, if you're a grower or if you're a shop, or even if you're a wholesaler, it's just it's bad karma to to start selling these cheap double ended light fixtures, or even the cheap digital light kits. Um, when you mess with electronics, especially electronics that get hot, like 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 light fixtures do, you're only going to cause problems. And I'd say to growers, it's probably it is the single uh, most dangerous part of the grow room. So if you're going to invest money, make sure you're getting proper lights. Um, making sure you're investing in the Revolution Divas, make sure you're investing in the E-Papions, the Gavitas. Um, Lux is a new name that's coming out, and they look like they're doing well in, in the US. Just look for good brands, do your research, make sure that the shop that's selling to you has had experience with it, has sold a few, and ask about return rates. Uh, good honest shops will start will give you this information. Um. So that's HPS versus HPS. Focus on the people that have innovated. There, there could still be more copies that come out. Uh, just be very thorough with your research. And if you have got a little bit of extra money to spend, spend it on good quality lights because it's a thing that you want to be absolutely bomb-proof in your room. System versus system. So this is so this goes back to um, the biggest one uh, in recent times was the Autopot versus the GoGrow. Uh, we've been over that. We're not going to revisit it because uh, I feel Autopot came out of that uh, the best. Uh, I don't know how GoGrow is doing now. They have changed the float design. Um, but it's that was an issue of imitating a product or feeling like you had a design of a product and bringing it in. Now, Autopot... You've got to think for for wholesalers and, and for manufacturers. You've got you've got to sort of understand as well that certain brands are a little bit of a sweetheart of the industry. A lot of people have got a lot of love for Autopot and for certain other brands in the industry. So, in my opinion, it was a little bit silly to copy that product. Uh, in my opinion, it it wasn't made any better, and it wasn't made dramatically cheaper either. So it was just a, it's it's an example of. Um, someone who's tried to make just get a grasp of of a gravity fed system market and try and put a new product out there um i can see where they, they tried to go and where they tried to where they've tried to perhaps make it better it, it didn't work and i feel like autobots come out of it the best but we've done that we did a video on it um and i'm not going to revisit that too much but systems versus systems there's not a whole lot that you can do i'm going to say to innovate a system um but I'm not an inventor, so there could be the best new system around the corner. You've got DWCs, you've got flood and drain systems, you've got gravity-fed systems, you've got drippers. Now, anybody that's looking to make innovations in the industry, and one comes to mind was the Medusa system. Now, I'm not that familiar with their systems because um, a lot of our shop is mostly hand-fed growers. That's what they 
that's what is the biggest proportion of our customers is hand fed rather than systems. Um, but I do know that the Medusa system was not just a copy; it was made with innovation in mind. It did things differently, and the guy behind the Medusa systems is an innovator. He is an inventor. And look them up on it on Google. Look up the Medusa systems. Um, they're really good for drain to waste. They, they do that really well. Uh, basically taking any runoff, making sure your pots aren't sitting in standing water, getting ripe with pythium. They do that really well. So there are some innovations in the system world, but not a huge amount. Um, in terms of you, the grower, the point I'll make about systems is that if you apply your hand feeder mentality, which is you give each individual plant a specific amount, or you should be, you should be weighing them with your hands, see if they're heavy, you don't feed them as much or at all. If they're very light, you make sure that you give them more to compensate for next time. So with the effort that you'd be putting into hand feeding, then it, you don't have to put that effort in anymore with a system. But what you should be doing is taking that time that you would have spent and using it on your plants. A lot of people will basically get that time back from having to feed them and just not pay any extra attention to your plants. That's the wrong method. If you apply the extra time that you've got into looking at the plants, checking the pest, checking for disease, using it to maybe try out a few new techniques like lollipopping, topping, fimming, uh, scrogging, any of these, you're going to get much better results. And the system will repay you back. You're paying money for a reason. The system does the work to allow you to spend more time on your actual plants. Um, and there's the systems that are out there have been out there for a long time. The systems that have innovated, have constantly innovated. We have the multi-flow, which started out with version one, the V1. Years later, it became the V2 with the standard trays to allow for more runoff. And the V3, which allows just more specific feeding terms. You have the first iteration of the IWS, which is a similar flood and drain system. And they've constantly made improvements to the IWS a pro and they've made thicker pipes so you can flood and drain quicker autopot autopot have constantly been making innovations because the very first autopot had i think i believe it was a two and a half or a three mil inlet to the valve and they've over testing and research and development they've managed to make that to a five mil i believe i might be correct i could be corrected but they've increased the size of the hole to the valve which means that you can now run thicker nutrients without the valve blocking up so all the all the systems manufacturers are constantly making innovations um so stick to one that suits you as a grower and if any new systems come out I'll give them a little bit of time there's a new system by uh developed by icon and i can't remember the name off the top of my head quite expensive well, i'd say it's very expensive but it does a lot of things right it's got the really big pipes it comes with all the air stones it drip feeds as well as bottom feeds you can use it as dwc recirculating dwc it's basically an all-in-one system and i haven't seen anything like that before so uh what are they called now hopefully somebody in the comments will be able to let me know what those systems are called josh if you can hear me is there any way of, of me seeing the comments here because it's on like a it's on like me me doctor page where it tells me the stream health. Should be, should be on the um, all right. They won't be right there. Nobody's trying. Nobody talk there's ten people watching, nobody's talking. They're so I'm bored by TVs. me. What? Might be watching on TV. Oh yeah. yeah. Or they're so bored that the ten people watching have all fell asleep and nobody's commented. So somebody write a comment for me, Josh, so I can make sure that that's yeah, working. <laughs> um so yeah, choose a system that's right for you. Make sure you spend that extra time uh, looking at your plants. Right, tent versus tent, innovation versus imitation. When we did the very first innovate versus imitate, I have re listened to it and said that the home box was actually the innovator. But we're now three years on. I've been able to meet people. I've been able to do research. And it turns out that the Bud Box was actually the original tent to market. I'm going to tell you a little story about Bud Box. And yeah, I can see that. Perfect. So I'm going to tell you a little story about silver versus white line tents and how we should be very careful of innovation versus imitation. Bud Box were innovators. 
they did a lot of research and they developed the par tents, the, the white line tents, the bug box pro as we now know them. Now white is very reflective and the material that they use in the bug box pro is highly reflective. The min- the least amount of heat spots and the most reflection onto the light. So a, a tent that you could say was trying to innovate came along with another tent and it was silver lined, the, the common silver lined tents that you all know today. Because silver looks more reflective to the human eye, the person who developed that silver tent said that our tent is more reflective. And because humans experience light reflected from a silver surface is more as more powerful, as brighter, it seemed obvious the silver tent is the better tent. So Bull Box tried to stick to the guns, just didn't want to produce the silver tent because they knew that it wasn't as reflective. But market, the market always dictates, the market always wins. And Bull Box had to make the silver tents uh, just to compete with these other ones. And it just, it's a little point to say that Bull Box were the innovators. Imitators came along and produced a tent, but was silver lined. So it could say a little bit of innovation, but maybe innovation is not always what we want in an industry. Maybe the first person that designed uh, the very first tent or the first indoor grow tent specifically was on the right track from the very beginning. We actually turns out took a few steps backwards going with silver line tents and the top peak performing growers today using tents will probably be using a white line tent and it will probably be a bull box pro white line tent. So innovation not always innovation not always the best thing as well and that's something this is going to be the last innovate versus imitate because i'm going to hopefully make some points that will if anything else is innovated or imitated in the future we can hopefully go back to this podcast and and re-listen and sort of take away some of the messages because this is a very holistic podcast to cover everything in imitation is not always a bad thing if nobody ever copied we wouldn't have the phone iPhone copied, they, and they were blatant in their copying of great designs. They made them better, and they produced the iPhone that we know today. If nobody copied, we'd still be walking around with cassette players. We'd still be walking around with the, um, you know, the what they called now, the the from i from Apple, and they were about five centimeters by five centimeters iPods. We'd still be walking walking around with iPods, and. Um, Nobody would have thought of, let's put an iPod into a phone and your phone's now your iPod. So imitation can get us to move towards new innovation. Um, so I don't want this to come across as though innovate, imitating is always bad. It's, it's a necessity sometimes. But sometimes innovating, in inverted commas, as in these silver line tents, we've innovated, we've produced a tent that is more reflective then we actually took two steps backwards. And sometimes innovating products aren't always the best. So we've got to just use our heads a little bit. Don't be sucked in by lovely marketing. Don't be sucked in by what people tell you. Don't be sucked in by what we tell you as MPK on the podcast. I've, I, we say week in, week out. Whatever we say, we want it to act as a stimulus to go and do further research. We want you to... We don't want you to agree with us. We want you to listen to us, take it on board and, and use that to go and do some Googling yourselves and go and look at do the breadth of research and come up with a good idea of, of what's going on. Innovation versus imitation. There's no right and wrong answer. And the message, so I'm onto the message of the podcast now. And this is, this is where I should have done this at the beginning because this is what I really want everybody to take home. Support imitators and save pounds support innovators and create millions and what do i mean by that if you support the innovators of of an industry if you support the imitators of an industry you will more than likely save yourself money because their way into the market is to do it cheaper use cheaper components get out to the market for cheaper and make themselves a little bit of money sometimes this works Sometimes it's right for the end consumer to not have to spend a thousand pounds on product X if they can get that product and it does an okay job for 250 pounds, then that is looking after certain 
end consumers, and that's a good thing. It means that you're not excluding those people that can't afford to spend a £1,000. But if you constantly support imitators, and just if you're a shop owner or you, you work in a shop or you're a manufacturer, a wholesaler, or you're a grower, specifically if you're a grower, because it comes down to your buying decisions that influence what we do. If you constantly try and buy the product that's just £5 cheaper or £10 cheaper to save yourself £5 and £10, then the innovative products don't sell as much. It's obvious. And the people who design those innovative products no longer start innovate. So where would we we would lead ourselves to in four or five years is an industry where we have a lot of people who are willing to copy an idea, but nobody who's willing to enhance ideas, make them better. There's nobody who's willing to take that red and blue LED and make it into a phosphor coated LED, which produces a white light. There's nobody to take to, to take that phosphor coating and decide that the amount of phosphorus is actually bouncing light back and we need to come up with a new way of delivering light to the plant. There's, how do we make LEDs more efficient? How do we take this 1,000 watt to blended HPS? Is there any way that we can make it run cooler? There's nobody with systems. Is there any way of delivering more oxygen to the root zone? Is there any way of directing feed into the plant so that we're giving the plants exactly what they want when they want? If we get rid of all of the innovators then we're going to end up in a very stale industry. And what happens in a stale industry is it becomes very easy for people to come in and, and swoop up, swoop in the millionaires, the billionaires, to come and swoop up a, a disjointed industry because there's no innovation. If there's constant innovation, then we're always improving and the UK can stand up and I think I'm going to piss off some of the uh, the national the international listeners, but I, I'm from the UK. I'm from Liverpool, and if I had to pick a country to do the best, it's going to be the UK. So I'm really passionate about the UK needs to look after and protect innovative products, innovative shops. If if there's a shop by you that's doing new things, uh, trying to do something different other than price crunch and do, we do it the cheapest. If there's a shop out there that's trying to deliver the best products, support those shops. If there's wholesalers that are looking on doing things differently, a, a way of business or uh, staying open leases that they can get something to you the next day where they would have shut off at two o'clock, they can now open till you can get your orders in at five. Support people who are doing innovative things because it moves the UK industry forward. And Cody's bouncing up and down as I'm making the speech and <laughs> he just can't concentrate. Piss off. Um, so the, the message of the podcast is support the innovators. Um, if you need to go and look at an imitator product because it's better on your bank balance, do it because it's a lot cheaper, knowing that the product is probably not as good as uh, the product, the, the more expensive product. Just do your research. Go and talk to your trusted grow shop. See what they've got to say about things. If we all went with the cheapest copied product, innovators will get fed up and stop innovating. The imitators haven't got an original bone in the body and the industry becomes stagnant. It's your choice. And I'm talking to the, the end consumers, the growers. It's up to you. It is you that dictates where our industry goes. I can only get my message across through podcasts, through YouTube, through Instagram. Uh, I can only try and help people by giving my opinions and my advice, but ultimately it's up to the people that buy the products. It is you who will di direct where our industry goes. And it's you that we're trying to get the message across to. Right. To finish off, Graham came up with a very innovative idea. This is Graham from Black Orchid. An idea to promote innovation. Maybe we could run a competition for new ideas and the winner gets a patent sponsorship. So this is a seed of an idea. I want it to start brewing throughout the industry. I want it to start brewing throughout wholesalers, manufacturers, shops. If you've got an idea for a product, we, somebody should collect these ideas and come up with a way of testing them, coming up with a winner, seeing which is the best product, and the winner gets a patent sponsorship. Now, this letter from Graham was sent quite a while ago. 
took a bit of time to get this podcast out there. But I'm going to get back in touch with Graham. Graham, if you're listening or, or anybody's listening that knows Graham from Black Orchid, get in touch with me because I think you've hit on a really good idea here. I really want to support innovative products. I want to push the industry forward. Um, I'm trying to do it in my own little way with the PGRs. I'm trying to get PGRs out of products so that there's no cheating. There's only so many ways that you can put salts together in a, in, with water and make new products. So people cheat by putting PGRs in there. Some of them, absolutely fine. Some of them have no negative benefit, negative effect on the human body and they have brilliant effects on the plant. That's okay. Most of the pe- most people use tricantanol, a seaweed derivative. But if you're cheating with bad PGRs, then we're going to find you out. And we're going to hopefully, in the next year or two years, push PGRs out of the industry or pushing bad PGRs out of the industry. And hopefully we'll have made a change for the better. So this way, I want to make a change for the better. I want to push forward innovators. I want to push forward inventors. I want to make the industry attractive to people that have got new ideas. And a, the, the worst thing of all that could happen from all of this is that somebody has the next best tint, LED, light, fan. Imagine there's a fan out there. There's an inventor right now and he's got a fan that draws 50 watts and can move 5,000 meters cubed of air an hour and sounds like five decibels. Imagine there's an inventor that's created that and he's looked into our industry and thought, yeah, bollocks to that because I've done spent a million pounds on this project uh, because I'm an, in, I'm an inventor and I love doing this. And I could go into that industry, but the old copy, uh, I'm probably going to leave it a little while. You don't want to get to a point where people don't want to produce new products because they're going to get copied. You want to support innovation and, and push this. And it, the same goes for the US and around the world as well. Anyone that's listening in the US, the same applies to yourself. I'm just obviously passionate about the UK because I want to push the UK forward. And we are coming for the US. We are coming for everyone else. The UK is about to stand up and uh, we'll get there eventually anyway. So that's today's podcast, uh, Innovate versus Imitate. Barry should have been with us. He's with us in spirit, but he's been terrorised by his beautiful boy who was born uh, two weeks ago on Tuesday. So congratulations to Barry. Um, and thank you once again to all of the partners of the show, Canna, Autopot, Sunlight, Can Filters, and Revolution Microelectronics. If you don't know those companies, please go and check them out because as well as being partners of the this podcast, they are also phenomenal products. So if you're looking for a new system, go and check out Autopot. If you're looking for a new fan and filter, go and check out Can Filters. A new LED for the summer months coming up for the hot weather, make sure you go and check out Sunlight. If you're looking for nutrients that are just will give you results every time, no matter who you are and what you're doing with them, have a look at go revisit Canna. If you've moved off Canna then and you're not getting the results you want, there's a reason why Canna's the most sold nutrients. And if you're looking for an absolute scorcher of a double-ended thousand watt HPS light. Or the three the three fifteen six thirty double ended ceramic metal halides, uh, Revolution Microelectronics, and they've got their Avicii LED as well. Go and check them out. It's been about fifty minutes. I think this podcast. Thank you very much for being with me. Um, I've been by myself, so I appreciate it. Can be a little bit boring. It, it can be a little bit stagnant because it's just me speaking. But if you manage to listen to it. Um, thank you very much for making it all the way to the end. Thank you to everybody that's watched live, uh, even though you probably all fell asleep because there's no comments. And I will see you next week for a much more lively podcast with myself, Stay, and myself, B. See, I, I knew I'd get Barry to do it one day. Right, that's it, Coates. Finish, let's go. And we'll see you all next week for the podcast. Bye-bye. 